Chapter Four of the Death of Ivan Ilyich by Leo Tolstoy. All were in good health. One could not use the word ill health in connection with the symptoms Ivan Ilyich sometimes complained of, namely a queer taste in his mouth and a sort of uncomfortable feeling on the left side of the stomach. But it came to pass that this uncomfortable feeling kept increasing, and became not exactly a pain, but a continual sense of weight in his side, an irritable temper. This irritable temper, continually growing and growing, began at last to mar the agreeable easiness and decorum that had reigned in the Golovin household. Quarrels between the husband and wife became more and more frequent, and soon all the easiness and amenity of life had fallen away, and mere propriety was maintained with difficulty. Scenes became again more frequent. Again there were only islands in the sea of contention, and but few of these, at which the husband and wife could meet without an outbreak. And Preskovya Fyodorovna said now, not without grounds, that her husband had a trying temper. With her characteristic exaggeration, she said he had always had this awful temper, and she had needed all her sweetness to put up with it for twenty years. It was true that it was he now who began the quarrels. His gusts of temper always broke out just before dinner, and often just as he was beginning to eat at the soup. He would notice that some piece of the crockery had been chipped, or that the food was not nice, or that his son put his elbow on the table, or his daughter's hair was not arranged as he liked it. And whatever it was, he laid the blame of it on Preskovya Fyodorovna. Preskovya Fyodorovna had at first retorted in the same strain, and said all sorts of horrid things to him. But on two occasions, just at the beginning of dinner, he had flown into such a frenzy that she perceived that it was due to physical derangement, and was brought on by taking food, and she controlled herself. She did not reply, but simply made haste to get dinner over. Preskovya Fyodorovna took great credit to herself for this exercise of self-control. Making up her mind that her husband had a fearful temper, and made her life miserable, she began to feel sorry for herself. And the more she felt for herself, the more she hated her husband. She began to wish he were dead, yet could not wish it, because then there would be no income. And this exasperated her against him even more. She considered herself dreadfully unfortunate, precisely because even his death could not save her, and she felt irritated and concealed it and this hidden irritation on her side increased his irritability. After one violent scene in which Ivan Ilyich had been particularly unjust, and after which he had said in explanation that he certainly was irritable, but that it was due to illness, she said that if he were ill he ought to take steps, and insisted on his going to see a celebrated doctor. He went. Everything was as he had expected. Everything was as it always is. The waiting and the assumption of dignity, that professional dignity he knew so well, exactly as he assumed it himself in court, and the sounding and listening, and questions that called for answers that were foregone conclusions and obviously superfluous, and the significant air that seemed to insinuate, you only leave it all to us, and we will arrange everything, for us it is certain and incontestable how to arrange everything, everything in one way, for every man of every sort. It was all exactly as in his court of justice, exactly the same air as he put on in dealing with a man brought up for judgment, the doctor put on for him. The doctor said, This and that proves that you have such and such a thing wrong inside you, but if that is not confirmed by analysis of this and that, then we must assume this and that. If we assume this and that, then... and so on. To Ivan Ilyich there was only one question of consequence. Was his condition dangerous or not? But the doctor ignored that irrelevant inquiry. From the doctor's point of view, this was a side issue, not the subject under consideration. The only real question was the balance of probabilities between a loose kidney, chronic catarrh, and appendicitis. It was not a question of the life of Ivan Ilyich, but the question between the loose kidney and the intestinal appendix. And this question, as it seemed to Ivan Ilyich, the doctor solved in a brilliant manner in favor of the appendix, with the reservation that analysis of the water might give a fresh clue, and that then the aspect of the case would be altered. All this was point for point identical with what Ivan Ilyich had himself done in brilliant fashion a thousand times over in dealing with some man on his trial. Just as brilliantly, the doctor made his summing up, and triumphantly, 
gaily even, glanced over his spectacles at the prisoner in the dock. From the doctor's summing up, Ivan Ilyich deduced the conclusion that things looked bad, and that he, the doctor, and most likely everyone else, did not care, but that things looked bad for him. And this conclusion impressed Ivan Ilyich morbidly, arousing in him a great feeling of pity for himself of great anger against this doctor who could be unconcerned about a matter of such importance. But he said nothing of that. He got up, and, laying the fee on the table, he said, with a sigh, We sick people probably often ask inconvenient questions. Tell me, is this generally a dangerous illness or not? The doctor glanced severely at him with one eye through his spectacles, as though to say, Prisoner at the bar, if you will not keep within the limits of the questions allowed you, I shall be compelled to take measures for your removal from the precincts of the court. I have told you what I thought necessary and suitable already, said the doctor. The analysis will show anything further. And the doctor bowed him out. Ivan Ilyich went out slowly and dejectedly, got into his sledge, and drove home. All the way home he was incessantly going over all the doctor had said, trying to translate all these complicated, obscure, scientific phrases into simple language, and to read in them an answer to the question, It's bad. Is it very bad? Or nothing much as yet? And it seemed to him that the upshot of all the doctor had said was that it was very bad. Everything seemed dismal to Ivan Ilyich in the streets. The sledge drivers were dismal, the houses were dismal, the people passing and the shops were dismal. This ache, this dull, gnawing ache, that never ceased for a second, seemed, when connected with the doctor's obscure utterances, to have gained a new, more serious significance. With a new sense of misery, Ivan Ilyich kept watch on it now. He reached home and began to tell his wife about it. His wife listened, but in the middle of his account his daughter came in with her hat on, ready to go out with her mother. Reluctantly she half sat down to listen to these tedious details, but she could not stand it for long, and her mother did not hear his story to the end. "'Well, I'm very glad,' said his wife. "'Now you must be sure and take the medicine regularly. Give me the prescription. I'll send Gerasim to the chemist's.' And she went to get ready to go out. He had not taken breath while she was in the room, and he heaved a deep sigh when she was gone. "'Well,' he said. Maybe it really is nothing as yet. He began to take the medicine, to carry out the doctor's directions, which were changed after the analysis of the water. But it was just at this point that some confusion arose, either in the analysis or in what ought to have followed from it. The doctor himself, of course, could not be blamed for it, but it turned out that things had not gone as the doctor had told him. Either he had forgotten, or told a lie, or was hiding something from him. But Ivan Ilyich still went on, just as exactly carrying out the doctor's direction, and in doing so he found comfort at first. From the time of his visit to the doctor, Ivan Ilyich's principal occupation became the exact observance of the doctor's prescriptions as regards hygiene and medicine, and the careful observation of his ailment in all the functions of his organism. Ivan Ilyich's principal interest came to be people's ailments and people's health. When anything was said in his presence about sick people, about deaths and recoveries, especially in the case of an illness resembling his own, he listened, trying to conceal his excitement, asked questions, and applied what he heard to his own trouble. The ache did not grow less, but Ivan Ilyich made great efforts to force himself to believe that he was better and he succeeded in deceiving himself, so long as nothing happened to disturb him. But as soon as he had a mischance, some unpleasant words with his wife, a failure in his official work, an unlucky hand at screw, he was at once acutely sensible of his illness. In former days he had borne with such mishaps, hoping soon to retrieve the mistake, to make a struggle, to reach success later, to have a lucky hand. But now he was cast down by every mischance and reduced to despair. He would say to himself, Here I'm only just beginning to get better, and the medicine has begun to take effect, and now this mischance or disappointment. And he was furious against the mischance or the people who were causing him the disappointment and killing him, and he felt that this fury was killing him, but could not check it. 
one would have thought that it should have been clear to him that this exasperation against circumstances and people was aggravating his disease, and that therefore he ought not to pay attention to the unpleasant incidents. But his reasoning took quite the opposite direction. He said that he needed peace, and was on the watch for everything that disturbed his peace, and at the slightest disturbance of it he flew into a rage. What made his position worse was that he read medical books and consulted doctors. He got worse so gradually that he might have deceived himself, comparing one day with another, the difference was so slight. But when he consulted the doctors, then it seemed to him that he was getting worse, and very rapidly so indeed. And in spite of this he was continually consulting the doctors. That month he called on another celebrated doctor. The second celebrity said almost the same as the first, but put his questions differently and the interview with this celebrity only redoubled the doubts and terrors of Ivan Ilyich. A friend of a friend of his, a very good doctor, diagnosed the disease quite differently, and in spite of the fact that he guaranteed recovery, by his questions and his suppositions he confused Ivan Ilyich even more, and strengthened his suspicions. A homeopath gave yet another diagnosis of the complaint, and prescribed medicine which Ivan Ilyich took secretly for a week. But after a week of the homeopathic medicine he felt no relief, and losing faith both in the other doctor's treatment and in this, he fell into even deeper depression. One day a lady of his acquaintance talked to him of the healing wrought by the holy pictures. Ivan Ilyich caught himself listening attentively, and believing in the reality of the facts alleged. This incident alarmed him. "'Can I have degenerated to such a point of intellectual feebleness?' he said to himself. Nonsense! It's all rubbish. I must not give way to nervous fears, but fixing on one doctor, adhere strictly to his treatment. That's what I will do. Now it's settled. I won't think about it, but till next summer I will stick to the treatment, and then I shall see. Now I'll put a stop to this wavering. It was easy to say this, but impossible to carry it out. The pain in his side was always dragging at him, seeming to grow more acute and ever more incessant. It seemed to him that the taste in his mouth was queerer, and there was a loathsome smell even from his breath, and his appetite and strength kept dwindling. There was no deceiving himself. Something terrible, new, and so important that nothing more important had ever been in Ivan Ilyich's life was taking place in him, and he alone knew of it. All about him did not or would not understand, and believed that everything in the world was going on as before. This was what tortured Ivan Ilyich more than anything. Those of his own household, most of all his wife and daughter, who were absorbed in a perfect whirl of visits, did not, he saw, comprehend it at all, and were annoyed that he was so depressed and exacting, as though he were to blame for it. Though they tried indeed to disguise it, he saw he was a nuisance to them but that his wife had taken up a definite line of her own in regard to his illness, and stuck to it regardless of what he might say and do. This line was expressed thus. "'You know,' she would say to acquaintances, "'Ivan Ilyich cannot, like all other simple-hearted folks, keep to the treatment prescribed him. One day he'll take his drops and eat what he's ordered, and go to bed in good time. The next day, if I don't see to it, he'll suddenly forget to take his medicine,' eat sturgeon, which is forbidden by the doctors, yes, and sit up at screw till past midnight. Why, when did I do that? Ivan Ilyich asked in vexation one day at Pyotr Ivanovitch's. Why, yesterday, with Shebek. It makes no difference. I couldn't sleep for pain. Well, it doesn't matter what you do it for, only you'll never get well like that, and you make us wretched. Preskovya Fyodorovna's external attitude to her husband's illness, openly expressed to others and to himself, was that Ivan Ilyich was to blame in the matter of his illness, and that the whole illness was another injury he was doing to his wife. Ivan Ilyich felt that the expression of this dropped from her unconsciously, but that made it no easier for him. In his official life, too, Ivan Ilyich noticed, or fancied he noticed, a strange attitude to him. At one time it seemed to him that people were looking inquisitively at him, as a man who would shortly have to vacate his position. 
At another time his friends would suddenly begin chaffing him in a friendly way over his nervous fears, as though that awful and horrible, unheard-of thing that was going on within him, incessantly gnawing at him and irresistibly dragging him away somewhere, were the most agreeable subject for joking. Schwartz especially, with his jocoseness, his liveliness, and his commule faux tone, exasperated Ivan Ilyich by reminding him of himself ten years ago. Friends came sometimes to play cards. They sat down to the card table. They shuffled and dealt the new cards. Diamonds were led, and followed by diamonds, the seven. His partner said, Can't trump, and played the two of diamonds. What then? Why, delightful, capital. It should have been. He had a trump hand. And suddenly Ivan Ilyich feels that gnawing ache, that taste in his mouth, and it strikes him as something grotesque that with that he could be glad of a trump hand. He looks at Mihail Mihailovich, his partner, how he taps on the table with his red hand, and affably and indulgently abstains from snatching up the trick, and pushes the cards towards Ivan Ilyich so as to give him the pleasure of taking them up, without any trouble, without even stretching out his hand. "'What, does he suppose that I'm so weak that I can't stretch out my hand?' thinks Ivan Ilyich, and he forgets the trumps, and trumps his partner's cards, and plays his trump hand without making three tricks. And what's the most awful thing of all is that he sees how upset Mihail Mihailovich is about it, while he doesn't care a bit, and it's awful for him to think why he doesn't care. They all see that he's in pain, and say to him, "'We can stop if you're tired. You go and lie down.' "'Lie down?' No, he's not in the least tired. They will play the rubber. All are gloomy and silent. Ivan Ilyich feels that it is he who has brought this gloom upon them, and he cannot disperse it. They have supper, and the party breaks up, and Ivan Ilyich is left alone with the consciousness that his life is poisoned for him, and poisons the life of others, and that this poison is not losing its force, but is continually penetrating more and more deeply into his whole existence. And with the consciousness of this, and with the physical pain in addition, and the terror in addition to that, he must lie in his bed, often not able to sleep for pain the greater part of the night. And in the morning he must get up again, dress, go to the law court, speak, write, or, if he does not go out, stay at home for all the four and twenty hours of the day and night, of which each one is a torture." and he had to live thus on the edge of the precipice alone, without one man who would understand and feel for him. 